Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, so I'll repeat them as you guys say them. Okay. And by the way, any, anyone else, feel free to talk to you. I don't, I don't. Does that make us immortal? That's all the time. Yeah. That's right. He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Yeah, really. What it amounts to is the conscience before God. Yeah. It's all in your head, type in crazy. No, we're not crazy. See, and it's, you know what? You may think this sounds strange, but it's a great inroad to people who are fully caught up in the new age thing, but it's a self-centered new age state of the mind. You follow? It's, for them, it's a state of the mind isolated and separated from God. Whereas what we're dealing with is the state of the mind, heart, thoughts, right? It's the state of the mind before God. Thank God. See, people say, oh, you know, Ward, you must, you're a Gnostic. No, I'm not. The Westminster Confession of Faith says this. We need to be raised up in the self-same body. That's Gnosticism because the Gnostics believed that the flesh was evil. I don't believe that this is evil. This is not evil. This right here is evil. He says it's not what's outside that defiles a man. It's what's inside. For out of the heart proceed all these things. <laughs> right? Yeah. Gee, how appropriate. So anyway, yeah. Okay. So um, how do we make progress both in our understanding of our position before God and how does that work it out in the life application? Um, the, the first passage that I think of is Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 1, where this is what Paul says. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches and the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Well, his first thing was, I'm praying that your eyes would understand what you have in Christ. And then once that takes place and you meditate and you are consciously thinking about the glory of God, the beauty of his body, the beauty of the new covenant creation, then what happens is if I look at you with that perspective as holy and blameless in his sight, what's that going to generate and create in me toward you? Hatred? I doubt it. No, on the contrary, if I'm not thinking about you that way and I'm not thinking about the glory of God and the beauty of the creation of the body of Christ and how it's a new creation and old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. If I don't look at you as totally having become new in him, Obviously, I'm going to treat you differently. Does that make sense? How we treat each other depends upon how we view each other. I mean, that's the whole reason Carrie has stayed with me. That's the whole reason. She views me as holy in Christ. If she viewed me any other way, you know, we'd be fighting for the kids or something, you know, the whole same thing. But how are we called to be different in this world? How are we called to be different? What does the world see? The world is used to the moral majority or the exact antithesis of that, right? They're not used to Paul's and Barnabas is coming out and saying, don't do that. We are men of like passions as you are. I wish Falwell would come on TV and says, man, I have like passions just like every homosexual out there. I say, what? What was Paul saying? We are men of like lusts. That's the stereotype, right? Come on. Let's stop putting on faces. Lust is the issue, is it not? Lust is the issue, men. Right? That's the problem. Paul didn't mince words. I had not known lust except the law. We continually view each other, and it's like this taboo thing to talk about. Ooh, don't talk about it. Don't talk about lust. Don't talk about masturbation. Let's deal with the issue. How do we view homosexuals? How do we view fallen heterosexuals how do we view people who fornicate how do we look at them if we keep telling these people i mean here's paul and these guys saying we are just like you guys sure we've been doing a few miracles here and there but we are just like you that blew them away instead of them looking at paul and barnabas and coming across like jerry falwell's it made them jerry what jerry falwell does is he makes people seem like they are different like he's not like them. Well, they don't want to be like that. They don't want what we have. But if they see, no, humility, right? Humility and joy 
and contentment in Jesus Christ and people loving. They shall know you're my disciples by your love for one another. If they saw that I was able to overcome something horrible that you did to me or something horrible that you were able to overcome something horrible I did to you, if they can see that and they can see you working out forgiveness in your life, that will draw them to the source of your joy, which is Christ. You see, and that's what I try to tell people. Yeah, it's a state of mind, but the state of mind totally fleshes itself out. And yet people are not seeing that in the church. People are not seeing that in the body of Christ. They're seeing division. They're seeing the street, right? Yeah. That's what they're seeing. And they say, I don't know, that's, that's not adding anything new to my life. Right? So instead, they're like, hey, man. My friends are going to be there too. I'm on the highway to hell. It's like they're sitting there thinking to themselves, hey, I want to be around people who are like me. Instead, we've got to show them something different. And that's what Christ did. Christ, the God of glory, said, sinners, let's hang out. Let me love you. You know, and I know, man, I'm coming from a, a very hardcore reform background too. I mean, it was very easy to place ourselves up on this sort of reconstructionist mentality. You know? Okay? Exactly. I mean, it was like, golly, you know, we're up, we uphold the law, and there are these people down there. I mean, shoot, you know, do we, what should we do with them? Should we stone them? <laughs> you know? I mean, valid questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and I, I would just add a little bit. I think that my perspective is different a little bit different because because most most evangelicals are in in the neo evangelical sense of the word still legalists okay and i believe they are doctrinally speaking their foundation i mean you don't hear them talking a lot about saying man you know i i am just as how many how many evangelicals do you remember saying i am just, by nature without the intervention of god i am just as wicked as any kind of homosexual out there, you know? And I keep mentioning homosexuals because that was the, the group of people that I, I scorned and that I looked upon with such disdain, right? I looked at them and just said, oh, how horrible, that's just sick, oh gosh, and all this stuff. And then the more and more I studied Christ and the more and more I studied who I am without Christ, the more and more I realized he doesn't view me any differently. If we've transgressed one, then transgressed them all. The moment I place myself under any standard, whether it's the 10 or the 613, if I place myself under one of those standards, I transgressed all of them. That makes me just like them. And for Paul to come out, Paul, I mean, Paul's my favorite character, you know? Paul, for him to come out and say, man, I'm just like they are. What then are we better than they? Anyway, answer your question. Uh, what was the question? No, just kidding. Um, basically, it amounts to this. Accountability comes through what we're doing here. Fellowship. I have a nature that wants to be alone. That's me. I have a nature that wants to be by myself. That wants to not fellowship. It's just my nature. But when Christ's nature intervenes, it makes me crave this. When I am by myself, and I isolate, the Bible says a man who isolates himself intermeddles with all wisdom right? When I'm by myself, that's when I find myself gravitating toward drunkenness, gravitating toward pornography, gravitating toward immorality, gravitating toward debauchery, gravitating toward brawling, you know, all these things I have the capacity to do, you know? You say, you mean you, you've actually fought in your life? <laughs> all these things, everything that I can think of, everything, when I isolate myself from fellowship, I, I fall back into it. You say, gosh, are you a Christian? You see, that's what we do to people. Gosh, are you a Christian? So the very thing that happens when we are down on the ground, people say, are you, you must not be a Christian. How can you call yourself saved when you're down? You see, what, what, what do I need? I need someone. I need the Jacks. I need the Tims. You know, I need the Steves. I need them to come up to me and say, you're struggling. Man, you know what? I know what you're going through. I know what you're going through. I have a dear brother. In, in from Pueblo, Colorado Springs area. And he and I have been communicating and been dealing with some of the, the most, the exact identical things in life. And there are few people that I'd rather be around. You say, wait a minute, 
What are you saying? You, you guys go out and fight together? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when we get together, I don't feel like there's this distance that I can never approach his level of holiness. Does that make sense? And so when I'm around you guys, I'm around love. I'm around people who, who go, you know, they're my cheerleaders. Go, Ward. Go, you know. Don't beat up that guy who flipped you off. Go. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, those, that's the type of people I want to be around. Love him. Love him. And it's not this weird kind of cheese ball love, you know. It's this type of love that is like, how do I love him? I show him love, and then I show him the glory of Christ. That's what I'm doing by showing him love. I'm showing Christ working through me. Man, I'm, I used to be the most legalistic, reformed guy. I was talking with Jack about it, man. And, and God is, is, and don't get me wrong, I still hold to many of the reformed tenets of the Christian faith. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous, you know? Sovereignty of God and salvation. Salvation solely by grace, through faith. You know, all that stuff. Faith being the gift of God. But anyway, I'm, I'm going on and on. That's, that's how I, it's fellowship. It's communion. That's what the Bible is all about. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Forsake it not. Pre-8070, post-8070. It's, it's all about each other because we are Christ here on this earth. We are Christ. We are the light. You are a city set up on a hill. Let your light so shine before men that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Right. Right, right. I believe it's definitely referring to... No, I, I, don't, I, I would say that it's, a, it's a, a, a past tense issue for us today. That that being made holy is talking about... See, if you read 2 Corinthians 3, which I know you have, obviously you've studied it, when he talks about this... As they turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There was a body that was being changed. Individuals, individuals in their consciences, they were seeing the fullness, the complete fullness that would be brought about in AD 70, okay, by the presence of God, the destruction of the temple. But as one turned to the Lord, that, that's why it is so crucial that we understand their connectivity in that body, that as one turned to the Lord, the veil was being taken away. And that first century body of, and I, I gotta say, it's talking about Jewish believers. It's primarily referring to Jewish believers that there was a body, even so now at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, right? That whole thing is dealing with the first century body of elect national Israelites. Same with Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter 3, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's dealing with the fact that there was a remnant that was coming out, just like there was a remnant in the, in the time of Elijah, right? There was a remnant. And so as they were believing on Jesus Christ, the veil was being taken away. And until the last of that remnant came in to the body into faith, the holiness, the complete holiness of the body was not yet uh, accomplished. So, but it was gradually, they were being made holy. Okay, I, I, I hope that kind of explains it. It's, it, Max King, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but Max King has, has a very wonderful diagram that shows, basically, it, it shows a, a covenantal man which represented Israel under the law. And so the cross, here's the point of the cross. Here's the old covenant in full force. And then the cross happens. Well, here's this body of believers, you know, this body of people or body, elect body of people. And as they believe, the old covenant is passing away and the new covenant is growing into fullness. And this growing into fullness is the new image. The growing into, you know, being deceased is the old image. And finally, at the destruction of the temple, which is huge in Hebrews, you cannot disassociate redemption from the destruction of the temple. You cannot do it. And people say, there's no, what, what significance was there in the destruction of the temple? Holy cow, that was the destruction of the place where God did commune under the old covenant with one person. But see, under the old covenant, Hebrews chapter 16, verse 17, no one was allowed into that place. The priests, plural, were not even allowed into that place. And only one guy, the high priest, one time a year. Well, now the vast difference is Christ, the high priest had to come out, remember, and so finally, in the New Testament, what he does is he destroys the temple, comes out of that, and brings the people back into the holiness of God, the presence of God, the holiest of all. So yeah, there was definitely a change taking place that, it, that doesn't apply to us today. We get to go through it instantaneously. Call it a rapture, call it whatever you want, you know. 
we are brought in. Let us come, therefore, boldly to the throne of grace. So how long is our question and answer time? I didn't even... Okay, we're, we're going to take up those. Oh, okay. Another question. Well, the first thing to do is come to them on their level and invite them out for a beer. <laughs> okay, that's the car. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just... I, Honestly, I mean, you know, I, I used to live in Sacramento, California. Some of you may have heard of a man by the name of Jim West, okay? Have you heard of him? Okay. He lives in Sacramento, Covenant Reformed Church, right? And I've met the guy, doesn't really like me too much because he doesn't like preterists. You know, he thinks we're going to hell in a handbasket. But one of the things you find about a lot of these guys is that they have, they take a lot of neat liberty issues that are, that are awesome that Baptists might not take right? Uh, for instance, my mom was a Baptist for a long time. Then I convinced her that a glass of Merlot is not sinful. <laughs> okay, and you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, Ward drinks. Yes, I, I drink wine. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I just look at it as a type of the new wine, you know, and so I drink a lot of it. No, just kidding. But anyway, so here, he makes a lot. He makes a lot. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, let's just tell our secrets, okay? <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Gosh, I live ten minutes from Big Water, which is a polygamous community. So anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, here's the thing. Um, I believe. See, they they love the ten. Postmillennial Reconstructionists love more than that. <laughs> you know, Rusas Rusduni loved the, the the you can't mingle garments. You know, you can't mingle different. Uh, different types of material in your clothing. And so he would wear polyester. I mean, just solid polyester, that guy would, you know, and he's the Chalcedon dude. And anyway, so here's, here's my view on that. This is my view. view. And, and, and if, I take it to, if, I, if I take these debates to an extreme with people, I think sometimes they can end up in being dotings about the law, strivings about the law, and so forth. I do believe that the law was made for the unrighteous. I don't believe that the law was made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for gainsaying, for manslayers, and you know, all, all, all that stuff. What I see in the new covenant, in, 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 when I say new covenant, and he made a great point, I think, it's, I think we should not divide this book into those, because if anything, it should be divided at Acts, between Acts and John, you know, but I, don't, I, I just don't think we should divide it. But what I see these guys saying Peter, and Paul, and, and even James. I, I, what I see these guys saying is that when we do exercise this love for one another, one another, we find ourselves being obedient to at least nine, right? We find ourselves being obedient to at least nine of those. I mean, you know, you're not going to catch me sleeping with a dog because the Bible says, you know, abstain from fornication. So people, they always bring up that. So what about bestiality? They always bring that up, right? You don't see that forbidden in Scripture in New Testament. You see it in the Old Testament, but you don't see it forbidden in the New Testament. You know, so what do we do, you know? So what I try to tell people that is, is well, Paul did say abstain from fornication. And... You even see that with the Gentiles in Acts 15. You know, you see an abstinence from form. There are certain things that you know if this person struggles, especially, like, for instance, drinking is, a, is an issue or eating meat. How do I deal with my brother or sister who is struggling with an issue? Do I just come out and say, you know, to the guy who's a Southern Baptist who got converted on Skid Row, you know, and all of a sudden now here he is going to a Southern Baptist church or whatever and alcohol free. Do I go up to him and say, hey, bro, let's get a six pack of Corona and some limes, you know, do, is that what I say to him? I think, and, I, and this is a roundabout way of answering the question, and that is I'm always having to consider where the other person is. And I definitely see New Testament commands for, you know, lie not one to another, right? Lie not, don't steal. But at the same time, you ask yourself the question. In the Old Testament, were there ever examples of lying? Like, for instance, how, how, do I how much do I love my wife and my kids? If someone comes into my house or example would be in China. If someone comes into my house and says, do you have two girls? 
<laughs> or whatever. Okay? And they say, we're going to kill one of your girls if you have two girls. I'm going to say, no, I don't. Sorry. Some people would say that's wrong. So, I mean, that's not standing up for the truth. No, I love my girls more than I love that person and the evil standard for which, you know, you know they stand themselves. So I, I have to be careful about that. But everything I see in the New Testament focuses on how can I demonstrate to them the love and forgiveness of Christ while maintaining the glory of God. And when I find myself doing that, it's a lot easier. When I find myself caught up in being mean to people, not bringing glory to God, I find myself transgressing more and more those nine in Exodus 20. Does that make sense? And then when it comes to the Sabbath issue, I think that's kind of a no-brainer personally. I think that in the eternal new heaven and new earth in which we reside, I think we live, we live out the Sabbath every day in Christ. And that it's, that that's our freedom. I, I know that wasn't real articulate, but... <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's the best I can give. <laughs> Good point, right? Yeah, well, I know, you know, one of the things that led me to Christ was seeing Christ's love for me. Basically, I was flipping off Christ in so many words. Yeah, it's a hard love for Christ to sit there and go, hey, you flipped me off. I paid the penalty for your sin. It's like, whoa. Return good for evil. You know, Romans 14 is awesome. Romans 14 is awesome because it, in that latter, those latter chapters of Romans, I mean, here the full thing is so doctrinaire, you know, and then you get to the end, Romans 14 and 15 and 16 even, he just talks so much about loving one another and then he, and then he finishes up this one, return good for evil. Return good for evil. I mean, does not Christ epitomize that saying? And I, I, I would strongly say that if we all were practicing that on a regular basis toward those inside and outside, we, I think we would start seeing some real neat things. That's hard to do. Thanks. You guys are wonderful.